When Officer Miranda was alerted through an anonymous tip suggesting she look into a young local's lemonade stand, she was somewhat skeptical. However, upon her arrival, she was taken aback by the unusually long line of customers eagerly waiting at the stand, far exceeding any typical turnout for a child's business venture. The scene was bustling, indicating that there was more at play than just a simple lemonade sale. As she observed the crowd and the operation of the stand, Officer Miranda's apprehensions grew, prompting her to believe that this situation warranted further investigation. Recognizing the potential complexity of what she was witnessing, she quickly made the decision to call for backup, requesting the presence of every available officer to manage and assess the unfolding situation comprehensively. Young boy could not simply be selling regular lemonade. This thought was spurred by the sheer volume of the crowd and the peculiar energy that surrounded the stand. Miranda's skepticism grew as she observed the boy's unusually professional demeanor and the high-tech setup of his lemonade stand, which included digital payment options and a sophisticated cooling system to keep the lemonade chilled. It was hardly what one would expect from a typical child's lemonade stand in a suburban neighborhood. As Miranda sipped on the lemonade she purchased, her concern deepened. Despite the drink's refreshing taste, there was an unusual, almost too perfect quality to it. This, coupled with the caller's insistent tone about something underhanded occurring, convinced Miranda that there might be more to this situation than met the eye. Deciding that this required more resources than she and Steve could provide alone, Miranda made the decision to call for backup. She reached out to her precinct, requesting immediate support. Within minutes, she had mobilized a significant number of officers to the location. Upon their arrival, the atmosphere changed dramatically. The additional police presence stunned both the boy managing the stand and the customers who were visibly taken aback by the sudden influx of law enforcement. With the task force in place, Miranda began a thorough investigation of the stand. The officers started questioning the boy and examining the setup more closely, looking for any signs of illegal activity or violations. They checked for permits, health code adherence, and any unusual ingredients in the lemonade. The community watched eagerly, Curious to see the outcome of such an unexpected and intense police intervention at what appeared to be just a popular lemonade stand run by a local youth, the unfolding scene left everyone wondering just what secrets lay behind this extraordinary business that had caught the attention of law enforcement to such an extensive degree. Could discreetly observe the lemonade stand? She noticed that the setup was unusually elaborate for a simple child-run business. There were banners, signs, and even a makeshift seating area. It seemed too well organized, which piqued her curiosity further. Miranda started to consider the possibility that the original complaint to the station might have been well-founded. Perhaps the woman who alerted them was more observant than simply being a bothered neighbor. Miranda pondered if maybe the woman had noticed something specific that had led her to believe something was amiss. As Miranda mingled with the crowd, Pretending to enjoy a glass of lemonade, she paid close attention to the interactions at the stand. The boy, while appearing to be the face of the operation, was possibly being coached by someone else, potentially an adult who intermittently checked on him from the doorway of the house. This observation hinted at a higher level of coordination behind the scenes. Miranda also took note of the clientele. Many seemed to be making a point of visiting the stand beyond what would be typical for a neighborhood lemonade business. Their generous tipping and the steady stream of customers could indicate that money was being laundered through what seemed like innocent transactions. Determined to delve deeper, Miranda decided to strike up casual conversations with some of the customers. She aimed to glean whether they were regulars or if something specific had attracted them to this particular lemonade stand. Her approach was careful and non-intrusive, as she hoped to uncover more clues without revealing her suspicions. Through her observations and interactions, Miranda began to piece together a clearer picture of the situation. It seemed increasingly likely that the lemonade stand was a facade for something more complex, possibly involving illegal activities. The diversity in the customers' profiles and their vehicles added another layer of mystery and urgency to her investigation. Resolved not to leave until she had concrete evidence, 
Miranda continued her discreet surveillance, her senses sharpened for any sign that could confirm her growing suspicions. After changing into her casual attire, releasing her hair, and putting on a pair of glasses that significantly changed her look, Miranda was transformed. She now appeared to be a completely different person, ready to discreetly investigate the local lemonade stand that had been the center of some peculiar activities. Her plan was to gather information under the guise of an ordinary customer. Before she could step out, however, her path was obstructed by her friend Parker, who stood firmly in front of the door. Despite this hindrance, Miranda's resolve to execute her plan remained unshaken. Alongside her was Steve, who was visibly upset about the delay. His stomach was grumbling, and he viewed Miranda's investigative efforts as an unnecessary diversion from their day. To resolve the situation, they decided that Steve would fetch some food for both of them while Miranda continued her investigation. He would return to pick her up afterward. Time was ticking, and Miranda was aware that she needed to act swiftly. Meanwhile, Loretta was already at the lemonade stand, trying her best to blend in with the crowd and observe the unfolding events without drawing attention to herself. She knew she had to remain patient, especially since Steve would be expecting them to leave as soon as he returned with their lunch. Convincing him that something out of the ordinary was happening at the stand would prove to be a challenging task. After queuing for a short while, Miranda began to notice a disconcerting feeling emanating from the crowd around her. It seemed as though she was under scrutiny. The other customers eyed her suspiciously as though trying to figure out who she was. The atmosphere suggested that these individuals might share some form of acquaintance, as there was a cohesive sense of inquisitiveness directed towards her. Intent on understanding more about the dynamics of the group and the reasons behind the prolonged wait, Miranda edged closer to a cluster of people and initiated a dialogue about the stand's apparent popularity. Her inquiries seemed to intrigue yet confuse the group, which only added to the air of mystery, with their guarded responses and odd looks. It quickly dawned on Miranda that her questions had marked her as an outsider, leading to a reduction in interaction from the crowd. The environment grew increasingly uncomfortable as people began to openly glare and whisper to one another, clearly suspecting her of being unfamiliar with the locale. Although unable to grasp their whispered conversations, the intent behind their murmurs was unmistakable. Despite feeling the urge to leave, Miranda knew she had a significant reason to stay. She held her ground, waiting anxiously for Steve to return, hoping to delve deeper into the situation. While waiting, Miranda decided to try the lemonade being served, which seemed unusually popular. Upon tasting it, she was immediately struck by its extraordinary quality. The lemonade boasted a depth of flavor that was unexpected, revealing subtle yet distinct notes of lavender and a mild sweetness of honey. It was evident that this was no ordinary lemonade, its unique blend of ingredients not only distinguished it from more common recipes, but also added an exotic richness that lingered delightfully on the palate. Expecting Miranda to adhere firmly to her mission, she was determined to unravel the mystery behind the lemonade's striking popularity. As she approached the bustling stand, her arrival did not go unnoticed. Amidst the hum of the busy market, one of the boy's relatives, who had earlier seen her near a police car, spotted her despite her attempt to blend in with a different outfit. They approached her with suspicion, questioning her presence and accusing her of seeking to stir up trouble due to their lack of a proper vending permit. Miranda, however, was not deterred. Her focus was singular, to discover why this lemonade was the talk of the town. As she stood in line, which took a considerable 15 minutes, the atmosphere grew tense. Whispers circulated and judgmental glances were cast her way, making her increasingly uncomfortable. Yet the young boy at the stand remained oblivious to the brewing storm. His demeanor was pure and unwavering, a stark contrast to the uneasy crowd. When Miranda finally reached the front, she was greeted by the boy's bright, welcoming smile. He cheerfully offered her a choice between his famed lemonade or another refreshment. This unexpected warmth and politeness softened Miranda's initial apprehensions and made her reconsider her judgments about the stand. Her interest deepened when the boy casually mentioned a uh, special lemonade. Curiosity piqued, she requested this particular variant. However, 
Her inquiry was met with hostility from a man behind her who loudly proclaimed that she did not deserve the special concoction. According to him, it was reserved for certain patrons, not for an outsider like her. Taken aback by the man's abrasive tone, Miranda felt isolated as the crowd seemed to share his sentiment. Turning to face her detractor, she found herself outnumbered and her resolve faltering. In this moment of uncertainty, the boy discreetly handed her a glass of lemonade, his smile paired with a subtle wink suggesting it might just be the special brew she inquired about. Grateful yet anxious, Miranda quickly paid and left, eager to escape the growing hostility. Once at a safe distance, she examined the lemonade more closely. The drink was unexpectedly dense, and the cup unusual in size and texture, confirming her suspicion that there was more to this lemonade than met the eye. This discovery was the first clue in uncovering the deeper layers of what made this simple lemonade stand a local sensation. Any tips he earned, but his dad was responsible for sourcing the cups. His mention of the cups piqued Miranda's interest further, urging her to delve deeper into the peculiarities of these seemingly ordinary containers. Upon returning to the secure environment of the police station, Miranda and her partner meticulously examined the cup that had initially caught her attention. After carefully separating the bottom section, which was cleverly designed to detach from the main body of the cup, they uncovered a small hidden compartment. Inside, to their astonishment, they found a compact digital device resembling a miniature GPS tracker. Realizing the gravity of their discovery, Miranda immediately consulted with tech specialists at the police department, who confirmed her suspicions that these devices were indeed used for tracking. The implications of this were alarming, and Miranda knew she needed to act swiftly to protect the public and uncover the full extent of this operation. With her heart pounding and her resolve strengthened, Miranda coordinated a thorough investigation into the source of these cups and the potential motives behind embedding tracking devices in them. She reached out to other law enforcement agencies and initiated surveillance on the company listed as the supplier of the cups. Approximately half an hour later, the setup was complete. The industrial area was quietly buzzing with the presence of law enforcement. With seven police cars discreetly positioned and 15 officers at the ready, Miranda felt a surge of responsibility. The initial approach to the lemonade stand was cautious yet deliberate. Officers maintained a low profile as they encircled the crowd, focusing particularly on a boy who seemed integral to the unfolding events. As the officers executed their plan, Miranda, filled with a mix of pride and anticipation, took command. Approaching the scene with her team, she instructed everyone to remain calm and assured them of their safety. Her eyes then locked onto the boy behind the lemonade stand, his expression a mix of confusion and fear. Miranda approached him with a gentle demeanor, placing a reassuring hand on his shoulder. She explained the situation in a calm, clear voice, ensuring the boy that everything would be handled with care. She asked him to explain the eye special nature of the lemonades, which, according to him, was nothing more than the unique cups provided by his father. The boy's initial confusion turned into a realization as he explained that the lemonade itself was ordinary, but the cups were specially designed. With this new information, Miranda's investigation took a deeper dive into the supply chain of these cups, determined to unravel the mystery and ensure the safety of the community. The additional revenue generated from the sales of the special lemonade, which was priced at a premium compared to the standard variety, became a crucial clue for Miranda. As she pieced the puzzle together, the reason behind the unusually high profits from the special lemonade became evident. With a newfound clarity, Miranda felt more determined to delve deeper into the matter, bolstered by the support of the young boy who managed the lemonade stand. Upon reaching the boy's home and confronting his father at the doorstep, Miranda could immediately sense the gravity of the situation. The father's face paled noticeably upon seeing the police officer, this reaction only confirmed his significant involvement in the suspicious activities surrounding the lemonade stand. As Miranda placed handcuffs on him, curious and concerned, murmurs rippled through the crowd gathered around the lemonade stand as they tried to make sense of the startling developments unfolding in front of them. The truth that emerged was astonishing to everyone, including the young boy who had been innocently involved. 
It turned out that the father had been exploiting his son's lemonade stand as a front for selling illegal substances. He cleverly concealed them at the bottom of the cups and discreetly informed his customers of the contraband while his unsuspecting son managed the innocent facade of the business. The boy's mother, completely unaware of the deceit, was horrified upon discovering the truth and promptly filed for divorce. The repercussions for the father were severe. His actions not only dismantled his family, but also marked the end of any cordial relations with his wife and son, who refused to speak to him thereafter. Facing serious criminal charges, he awaited trial, likely to be deprived of his freedom for a long time given the gravity with which the judge viewed the case. Miranda, who successfully cracked the case, felt a mix of professional satisfaction and personal sorrow. She was content with her role in unveiling the crime, yet empathetic towards the boy who lost his father and the normalcy of his life in such a dramatic fashion. Despite the upheaval, the boy resumed selling lemonade, this time with a legitimately revamped menu. Miranda kept in touch, checking on him regularly, and found him to be doing surprisingly well. She felt immense pride in his resilience and sincerely hoped for his continued happiness, believing wholeheartedly that he deserved every bit of joy life could offer. After watching this story, do you have any thoughts? You can share it with everyone in the comment area, and then we will bring you in another touching story. Let's continue. In the heart of the Deep South, during a late night shift at a diner, a waitress's simple act of kindness towards a black homeless man reveals an unexpected turn. It was 3 past 2 a.m., and Constance was working yet another graveyard shift, her worn sneakers barely qualified as shoes anymore, and her feet ached persistently. Behind her, a fresh pot of coffee sputtered, its bitter scent doing nothing to alleviate the thick haze of old grease that hung in the air. As the door of the diner creaked open, its discordant chime sliced through the quiet night, an elderly black man shuffled inside, his clothes ragged and his gaze fixed on the floor, the overnight regulars, a trucker nursing his fourth refill and a blurry-eyed couple locked in a silent argument, watched his entrance with a mix of disgust and weariness, Constance approached the man with a practiced smile, asking if he preferred to sit at a table or the counter. He simply requested a cup of black coffee, as she poured him a mug, a familiar pang of pity flickered in her chest, it shouldn't matter, but in this greasy nowhere, it did, he was the wrong color, and her gut told her that making a fuss would cost her more than spare change, ignoring the judgmental stares boring into her, Constance decided to act against the unwritten rules of the diner, as she surveyed the untouched plates cluttering the counter, defiance bubbled up within her, screw them, she thought, she snatched up a half-eaten stack of pancakes and, on the way back, added a side of bacon scavenged from a forgotten order. It's on the house, she told the man, his shoulders straightened just a fraction, surprise flickering across his lined face. Slowly, he lowered himself into a cracked vinyl booth and ate each bite slow and deliberate. As he did, his tension seemed to melt away, and Constance felt it too, a warmth spreading despite the chill of the diner. It was a tiny victory born of leftovers against the judging eyes and the crushing weariness that had become her life. As the last bits of bacon disappeared, the man pushed his plate aside, his eyes, no longer clouded by hunger, revealed a depth she hadn't anticipated. He told her that the generosity she displayed was rare these days. Then, reaching into the pocket of his threadbare coat, he pulled out a crumpled bill that Constance recognized as $100, even in the dim light. He slid it across the worn counter along with a faded business card, for your trouble, he said, his voice barely a whisper, I'll be back to see you soon, and with that, he left, leaving Constance in a state of shock and terror, realizing that her simple act of kindness might indeed open a can of worms, but who was this man, and what did his promise of return imply, the implications were vast, and as the diner clock continued to glare at her, it marked the beginning of a story that was far from over, as he walked through the door and vanished into the bustling street beyond, she was left puzzling over an unexpected detail, a homeless man possessing a business card, curiosity peaked, she held the card up to the light, her eyes scanning the name printed on the weathered paper, a sudden chill of recognition coursed through her as she read the name, Lawrence Carter, 
Memories flashed back to her childhood, when Carter's gaunt. Somber face appeared on the evening news, back then, she was just a small child, but the image of his grainy mugshot, plastered across the windows of local stores, was unforgettable, he was labeled, the fugitive, a man accused of turning a peaceful protest into a violent riot, leaving behind a city shaken by bloodshed and fear, when the realization hit her, a whisper of terror escaped her lips, panic surged within her, why had Lawrence Carter come back, was his appearance a threat? If she reported him, would the police suspect a connection between them and mistakenly brand her a criminal too? Throughout her shift at the diner, every shadow morphed into Carter's stooped figure, every rustle of the wind mimicked the sound of approaching sirens. As the day wore on, she maintained a facade of calm, continuing to serve coffee with a practiced smile, though her senses remained on high alert. Yet, Lawrence Carter did not reappear, the sun rose, customers came and went. But the unease gnawing at her only deepened, eventually, overcome by exhaustion and fear, she slumped into a back booth during her break and pulled out the business card he had left with a $100 bill, now, the card seemed heavier, the name, DR, Lawrence Carter, emblazoned on it felt like an accusation, images and memories flooded her mind. She recalled history textbooks from her barely completed school days and snippets of old documentaries her father watched. Carter had not only been a professor but also a fiery civil rights activist in the 1960s, then came the accusations, a protest that ended tragically, and the infamous police mugshot that still haunted the city's collective memory, the diner's phone, an ancient rotary model nestled between the cash register and the pie display, rarely demanded attention but now rang insistently, its relentless peeling jangled her frayed nerves, tiredly, she answered. The voice on the other end introduced herself as Detective Eleanor Barnes from the Mobile Police Department, the detective explained that they needed to discuss Lawrence Carter, mentioning that an informant had seen him at the diner in the early hours, as she processed the detective's words, the world around her seemed to fall eerily silent, the clattering of plates and the hiss of the grill faded as if abruptly muted, with a lump in her throat. She promised to come down to the station once her shift ended, expecting the stereotypical harsh interrogation rooms of cop shows, she found the reality of the police station quite different, bracing herself for what was to come, Detective Barnes' office was unexpectedly neat and organized, reflecting a stark contrast to the chaotic nature of her work, the detective herself was a woman in her mid-forties, sporting a practical short bob that framed her sharply observant eyes. These eyes seemed to pierce through Constance as she entered the room, a gaze so intense it felt as if it could unravel one's deepest thoughts, Detective Barnes expressed her gratitude to Constance for her cooperation before delving into the matter at hand, the case involving Lawrence Carter, Constance painstakingly recounted the events of that fateful night, as she spoke, the room seemed to grow heavier, the silence so thick it felt almost suffocating, once she finished. Detective Barnes posed a critical question, highlighting the gravity of the situation, was Constance aware that she had unwittingly assisted a fugitive, the interrogation that followed was exhaustive, Constance felt as though her simple, uneventful life was being dissected under the relentless scrutiny of the detective, guilt, the fear, and a flicker of sympathy for Carter swirled within her, was the Carter she had met, the gentle, old man with eyes carrying the weight of unspoken stories, really the same person vilified in the media as a fiery young revolutionary turned accused criminal, as Detective Barnes leaned forward, her expression softened slightly, signaling a turn in their conversation, she acknowledged that Constance had found herself inadvertently caught in a complex situation and was free to go, however, she was urged to contact the police should Carter reappear. Especially considering the suspicious nature of the $100 bill he had used at the diner, it hinted at either illicit activities or a hidden support network, shaken by the implications of her simple act of kindness, Constance felt trapped in a net meant for much larger prey, she left the police station with a heavy heart, her mind besieged by relentless questions, should she betray Carter if he returned, what was the right thing to do, the diner, once a haven of greasy comfort, now felt claustrophobic as whispers about the incident spread among the patrons. The community was divided, some condemned Carter, convinced he had incited chaos intentionally, 
while others believed he was merely caught in unfortunate circumstances, much like Constance, memories of the protest, which she had been too young to fully grasp at the time, now played back in her mind, distorted by time and the varied interpretations of her neighbors. Carter's weary eyes and the vulnerability he exhibited under the dim diner lights sparked a resolution in Constance. She needed to find the truth for herself, as a low murmur of chatter continued around her, a sudden revelation struck, slipping out the back door, she knew her next step was to find Carter and confront the past to understand her own stance in this tangled web of moral dilemmas, Constance was taken aback by the sheer number of souls haunting the shadowy corners of Mobile's underbelly. The city's homeless population was hardly hidden, yet the reality was more jarring than she had anticipated. Her inquiries often led to suspicious looks and dismissive shrugs from the inhabitants, just as she was about to abandon her quest, a figure shrouded under a discarded tarp caught her attention, she tentatively called out Carter's name, her voice barely above a whisper, as fear and a rush of adrenaline-fueled determination gripped her, the figure slowly sat up, Carter squinted at her, his face a complex tapestry of surprise and deep-seated weariness, you shouldn't be here, he rasped. This is no place for a decent woman, ignoring his warning, Constance bit her lip and pressed on, explaining that the police had been questioning her, and she desperately needed to uncover the truth, Carter sighed, a sound heavy with a lifetime of fatigue, and asked, and what will you do with that truth, child, sell it to the highest bidder, Constance vigorously shook her head, explaining her predicament, the police suspected Carter had paid her $100 to secure her silence, but she remained conflicted and sought his version of the truth, was he framed, was he innocent, as they sat in the stale air of the alleyway, Carter averted his gaze, looking down at his hands which, despite being worn and scarred, appeared surprisingly gentle, doesn't matter if I'm innocent or not, he said resignedly, the system decided my guilt long ago, that's the truth that counts, they sat in silence, surrounded by the unseen, unheard lives of the city. Constance felt more lost and broken than ever, the image of Carter huddled in the alley, his quiet resignation searing into her memory, they framed me, Carter finally confessed, his words striking Constance like a cold slap, not the cops, he clarified, but people far more powerful, those who don't dirty their hands yet have blood on them nonetheless, they made it look like I'd lost control, that I turned a peaceful movement violent, disgust was etched into his features as he explained why. Carter now had a revolutionary glint in his eyes as he revealed that he was targeted because he spoke inconvenient truths and rallied disenfranchised people around him, such actions made him a dangerous individual, especially to those who couldn't buy or break him, sinking back into a spot close to a warming fire. Carter recounted how these powerful entities destroyed his reputation and his family but failed to extinguish his spirit, he said he had hidden in plain sight and concluded by declaring that he was poised to retaliate, not through violence but with the resolute force of truth. Suddenly, a deafening crack disrupted the fragile stillness, it wasn't gunfire but something heavier, more menacing, she thought briefly, Constance whipped around to see figures in black swarming into the camp, not wearing uniforms, but displaying the chilling efficiency of a well-oiled machine. Carter yelled at her to flee, but Constance stood frozen. Transfixed by the cold brutality unfolding before her, tents were violently torn open, meager belongings scattered, and desperate cries were swiftly muffled by rough hands, they followed you, Constance, Carter shouted, his voice urgent, snapping her out of her horrified trance, they're here for me, go, he pushed her away forcefully, Constance ran blindly, her feet pounding the dirt paths, with the echoes of gunfire and ragged screams spurring her on, she burst through the undergrowth. The city lights in the distance seemed a world away. As she gasped for breath, her lungs burning, she stumbled onto a cracked sidewalk and a scream pierced the night. It was her own, pain ripped through her shoulder, a fiery shockwave knocked her to the ground, and the world tilted crazily then faded into blessed blackness. Constance awoke to the sterile glare of hospital lights and the lingering echo of her own scream in her memory. Every breath was a painful effort. Her arm throbbed in an uncomfortable cast, a grim-faced Detective Barnes stood by her bedside, she told Constance that they had captured Carter, the elusive wording was enough to clear the fog from her mind, if she asked, who got Carter, the police, 
Barnes didn't reply immediately, instead, she fished out a crumpled business card from her pocket, and Constance recognized it instantly, the faded ink bore Carter's name, but it wasn't the card itself that chilled her. It was the scrawl across the back, just a name, Senator Winslow, Constance knew who he was, a man known for his bigotry, lies, and narcissistic demeanor, a caricature who always seemed to get away with everything, a so-called pillar of the community with his smiling face plastered on billboards, yet, the power in that hastily written name was as cold and lethal as any gun, Detective Barnes watched her, a flicker of something resembling respect flashing in her eyes, the fight never ends, Constance. She said softly, it just changes shape, six months later, Constance remembered those words, indeed, something had changed shape in those months, the town no doubt, and her life as well, Constance no longer worked at the diner, her days were now filled with interviews and hastily scribbled speeches, her stubborn determination echoed that of the man she was waiting for, under her guidance, and with the support of Detective Barnes, Carter's name wasn't a stain anymore. Barnes had become more than just a name, it had evolved into a powerful symbol of change, a beacon in the struggle for justice, no matter how challenging the path, on that pivotal day, the detective had revealed to Constance that they had been covertly collaborating with Carter for years. He had long harbored suspicions about the individual who had stirred the protests and subsequently shifted the blame onto him to undermine his community efforts, despite his suspicions. He lacked sufficient evidence for the police to take action, however, the clumsy handling of the attack on the homeless camp provided a breakthrough, Detective Barnes and his team were able to uncover vital clues, clues that led them straight to the doorstep of Senator Winslow, the gates of the prison loomed like an unsightly blemish against the bright morning sky, they had attempted to crush his spirit, to silence his narrative, but now it was Constance's turn. She wielded his suffering as a formidable tool against the very injustice that tried to extinguish his voice. Months earlier, she had picked up the mantle from where Carter had left off, her relentless efforts, including endless rallies, television interviews, letters, and petitions to the Department of Justice, had finally borne fruit, the overwhelming pressure had become impossible for them to ignore, eventually, Senator Winslow faced impeachment, his influence was shattered. And he was now up against criminal charges, the days of the bigoted, narcissistic Senator Winslow and his cohorts were coming to an end, as the prison gates creaked open, there stood Carter, older, leaner, his eyes marked by weariness yet unyielding, when Constance met his gaze, a silent promise was exchanged between them, the battle was far from over. What a poignant conclusion to their saga, that's today's story, after listening to the above two stories, do you have any thoughts, you can tell us in the comment area, if you like them, please subscribe and like them, see you next time.